Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Palace Confidential. I'm Joe Elvin and now from princes to prime ministers to plutocrats, Tom Bauer has written some of the most read and talked about biographies of the past 40 years. For his new book, he has turned his pen towards the Duchess of Sussex in a book called Revenge, Meghan and Harry and the War Between the Windsors. And I'm delighted to say that Tom is here today. Welcome, Tom. Thank Thanks you for so being much. here. First of all, Tom, why Meghan? Well, because uh, she poses a challenge to the royal family and she's a fascinating person. I mean, mm. she's a person who started from nothing and has become a world global star. And that route to the top uh, has never really been properly reported and examined and investigated. A huge number of sources wouldn't speak to you, people, people who were aligned with Meghan, is that true? Absolutely. She did her very best and her staff yeah. to stop people talking to me, but was not totally successful. <laughs> so who did you speak to? Well, I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to slip it in. I, I tried. I spoke to a lot of people. Some were on the record. I mean, like her father, yeah. uh, like some boyfriends, like uh, people who worked with her in Hollywood people who came across her in Canada, which was very important, people in London. No, there were over 80 people who did talk, mm. but there were a couple of hundred who I approached who didn't talk. But, you know, in the end, they were just said things, perhaps, which weren't uh, that interesting. But I tried very hard to get her point of view, mm. uh, but she did her best to prevent that happening. Yeah. Now, let's go briefly back to her early life, and there was a lot of family complications. A lot of families are complicated, but... It does sound like Meghan's was more complex than most. Well, I think it became complex, I think, at the time. I mean, her mother and father were very, from very different cultures and very different backgrounds. But the father was deeply in love with uh, Doria, her mother, and more in love, besotted by the birth of Meghan, mm. because he had had two children from a previous marriage and had a very difficult marriage. So he was determined to spoil Meghan rotten, which is what he met, admitted he did. Mm. The marriage broke up very swiftly because of their very different backgrounds. You have to read in the book what went wrong. And uh, she had a terrific childhood. He got her into one of the best schools in Hollywood. She was a good student. He took her out for lots and lots of treats, travelled a lot with her outside L.A., took her then, of course, onto the set, the ABC set, where he was the lighting director. She had some very, very close good friends, families that looked after her where, while her father was working. So it really was a very stable childhood, a happy childhood. And she gets into one of the best university colleges of America, mm. Northwestern, because of her education and background. So by no means anything other than a happy childhood, although a broken family. But it's fascinating, isn't it? Because even listening to you talk then, that narrative is at odds with what I've assumed about her relationship with her father. Well, of course, and that's why yeah. I did, wrote the book. She was besotted by her father, kept on thanking him until she was, uh, until <laughs> before she met Harry for his kindness and generosity and all the rest of it. But uh, that relationship, as you rightly say, fizzles out in a spectacular way. Mm. But had already uh, the, the, the sort of the seeds of disaster were sown after she moved to Toronto to work on suits. She divorced herself from her past. She was determined to cut herself off from Hollywood and build her own new life in Toronto. Mm. And that meant even abandoning her hus new husband and obviously her father too. If there's one consistency with Meghan that we've seen, is it's this drive in ambition, isn't it? Well, yes, there's nothing wrong with ambition. Mm. I mean, that's why I write all my books about uniquely ambitious people, mm. narcissists very often. The problem with them is that their ambition always causes victims. And how do they treat the victims? And do they trample them or do they try to ignore them? And how, how do they get ahead and stay on top? And that's what makes Meghan, like other people, so interesting. And, and what do you make of, I think you described it as her willingness to conceal humiliation, as you put yes, it. Yes, I think that's what she learned in Hollywood and from her father, that however hard you're knocked, only smile. That's why when you see Meghan today smiling, the smile is all fixed and part of the act. Uh, and I think that's very good. I mean, if you're an actress, you are a politician, you never want to concede defeat to your uh, attackers. Now, let's turn to Harry just for a moment, because I love some of your descriptions here. Before he joined the army, you're fairly forthright in your assessment that you write he appeared alternatively charming, spoiled, badly educated, simple-minded and demanding, and that previous girlfriend said he lacked class, was unromantic, unserious, short-tempered, imperious. What on earth 
did Megan see in that then? She saw someone who was needy. <laughs> she saw right. somebody she who, could fix. She, exactly, who yeah. she could use mm. and who could serve her purposes. And to be fair, I think Harry saw the same in her. He was looking for someone who, despite all those minuses, wanted him. And she, she did want him because she then was promoted from an unknown actress into a global star. So they served each other. Mm. What, what do you think happened to Harry? You know, because their meeting from the reports from a lot of chorus, royal correspondents say that there was a change in his behaviour. We were talking in a show earlier last week about how he used to be this smiley, jovial, sort of like party prince, and that he went from being quite friendly and jolly to surly. Yeah. Well, I think Meghan sees enemies everywhere, um, as he did too. And whereas he was sort of nurtured to be kind to people, because that's part of the royal performance to look after, uh, Meghan didn't see that. Meghan saw no reason not to be the Hollywood diva. Hmm. And the Hollywood diva, uh, the whole act, is to be nice on performance, but in reality, hate the whole thing unless it's your own advantage. Hmm. And I think he slipped from what was uh, the natural person who everyone in Britain loved and saw the smiley uh, person who played with children, Urson uh, Bolt and the whole thing, into this vengeful person full of vengeance. I think Meghan encouraged the vengeance. Meghan encouraged the anger and the hatred and seeing enemies and paranoia. So a, a lot of people uh, accuse Meghan of sort of changing Harry, but do you think this is the real Harry? No, I don't. I think that the, it's just Harry being a simple soul has easily changed to suit Meghan's agenda. And Meghan's living with Meghan is very different than living with Kate and William. Mm. Uh, Meghan has a completely different attitude, and I think California has a different attitude. So I think we're now seeing a different Harry, and to his misfortune, it is not a Harry that uh, appeals to the same sort of people in the same numbers as previously. Mm. But uh, you also describe a, a change in Meghan's personality, that, if, you know, some, somewhere between her journey from Toronto to Kensington, her, she lost her famed empathy. Well, I think what's fascinating about Meghan's life is that she changed when she got to Toronto from L.A. And even when she married Trevor, uh, she still stayed in Toronto to the surprise of the producers of Suits, because all the other actors lived in L.A. and commuted to Toronto to film and went back home. Mm. She, even though she was married, she never wanted to live with Trevor in L.A. She was determined to build a new life. And uh, therefore, Trevor is abandoned. And even at their wedding, she forbade any photographs and destroyed the video, the official video, because she wanted no record of the wedding, uh, even at the time. Mm. And what she did in Toronto was she got into with a, a small establishment, but a very rich set. And she loved that. See, Megan loves money. Megan's very commercial. She doesn't want to be poor. And then having got all that, she then saw how she needed a consort, a husband, who was going to take her to the next stage. And she was on a manhunt. There's no doubt. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being on a manhunt. There are women hunts too. But, I mean, she was determined yeah. to find someone who could build her up. And Cory Vitiello, the chef she was living with in Toronto, he was a good bloke, a nice man. But he wasn't good enough mm. for an ambitious woman. And reports are, are rife that they've both... Harry and Meghan shed a lot of friends over the years. And it's, it, who are their friends now? Well, I think they'll be local Californians. I mean, I mean that's one of Harry's <laughs> the perplexing parts revealed in the book, is how, when he introduced her to her friends at the shooting weekend in Sandringham, uh, the friends were all told off by Meghan for their jokes, for their behaviour, for, for being Etonian stockbrokers or whatever. She didn't like their non-workery. Right. And after the shooting weekend, they're all texting each other, oh, my God, what's all this about? And, of course, they're not allowed to come to the dinner after the wedding. I mean, people whom he'd known for years. And even at the wedding of uh, Tommy Inskip in Jamaica, uh, one of the parents who was there told me that, they, that Meghan had behaved appallingly. They just couldn't understand why Harry was going out with her. She didn't like the food, she didn't like them. So it was very difficult. So he's broken with his friends, his English friends, and, you know, American friends for sure, but whether they're genuine or not, or just well, they, this... whether they just like Harry and Meghan for their fame, uh, only they can explain. Do you think they have close friends? Because I remember commentating on the wedding and 
sort of like being surprised to learn later that she didn't really have a great friendship with Oprah Winfrey at the time. Well, she didn't know Oprah Winfrey yeah, at it's all. Like, it's crazy. There was no isn't friendship. It? Yeah. The whole wedding. What was amusing was the father, Thomas Markle, told me that he knew the people at the wedding better than Meghan because he'd filmed with them all yeah. at ABC and other studios. Meghan didn't know opera. She'd met her once for a few minutes. She didn't know George Clooney. That was a passing once they'd met. I mean, all it was all for her future. Mm. I mean, she used the wedding to build up her career when she returned to Hollywood. I don't believe. She ever really intended to stay in Britain for long. Mm, it's fascinating, isn't it? You, you do address in the book a couple of big disputed talking points. The first is the tears during the bridesmaids fitting of the royal wedding. Now, in your version, it was an exhausted Kate who was driven to tears and her attempt at reconciliation was rebuffed. And then, of course, we have Meghan talking on the Oprah interview about how it was actually Kate who made her cry. What, what's your story? Well, the problem with Meghan's version is that she's told so many untruths in the opera interview, whether about race, that she said that she wasn't really married that day in Windsor, they'd been married three days before, about protection, security, all these sort of things, that you have to take everything she says on that said in that day with a pinch of salt. And when it comes to who made who cry, I'd believe Kate any day because I, in my book, Kate is a, is a hero and a great woman. And I don't believe that she would go out of her way to uh, disparage uh, Meghan. Whereas by then, of course, Meghan was uh, accused of bullying the staff, which really did hurt Kate a lot and was accused of being misbehaving. So I wouldn't believe Meghan's version of that. So was it your, is it your opinion? that's in the book, or did you No, I, I found sources. Yeah. I mean, of course, I talked to sources. Yeah. But, of course, sources could invent as well. But I prefer to believe them rather than Meghan. Mm, fair enough. Then the second I, thing I want to discuss is that famous royal racism claims that you just touched on. You suggest that Harry actually laughed off questions from his family about what a child with, of his and Meghan might look like. And it was only his mood changing when he discussed it with Meghan, who did not see the funny side at all. Well. The, the, the most important point, uh, two important points. One is, it's quite normal for parents, grandparents, family saying, what will your new child be like? At the point of that discussion, even on Harry's version, especially Harry's version, they debate what any future child would look like long before he'd even proposed marriage to Meghan. But on Meghan's version in the Opera interview, the conversation happened when she was pregnant. Now, who do you believe? Mm. Clearly, Harry. Is, Harry is so stupid, he wouldn't actually tell a lie about something like that. So I believe that. And I think Meghan used his recollection of that. You know, I don't think it was a serious conversation. It was just one sort of um, passing mention to use that to attack the royal family. And that was, I thought, unforgivable. And unforgivable lot for Winfrey not to investigate it further to see about the contradiction between Harry's version and Meghan's version. She just let Meghan's version go by the ball, and I think that was wrong. But I thought that was a terrible indictment of Meghan to actually spin the story, which, according to Harry, and he's the original source, was untrue mm. and cast terrible uh, uh, cloud over the royal family. And that, to this day... Well, do you imagine a day when we might ever get to the bottom of who allegedly said... This terrible well, thing. there are hints in the book. Mm. I won't talk through okay. There are hints in the book. Well, watch this space. Another thing we have discussed lots on this show is Meghan's potential political ambitions and her activism, her proximity to important Democrats, and so on. So, I, and I know you spoke to lots of people in America for the book. And what, what do you think the future holds there? Are we really going to see a Meghan presidential run? Well, I think what's very interesting, which I did discover, is completely new in the book, is how she got introduced to American politics. In a nutshell, it was through a, a New York hotelier called John Fitzpatrick, who introduced her to Hillary Clinton. And Hillary Clinton then becomes a mentor to her and helps her in many ways and speaks up for her after the opera interview, quite surprisingly, mm. and arranges for her so-called philanthropy. And I think that she does see her future as possibly the beginning of a congressman for California. There are 40 seats there, and many, most of them are Democrat. So I see that. But her problem is twofold. One is that it's very badly paid, and Meghan needs a lot of money she to live. She does need a lot of money. Yeah. She needs a lot of money. Yeah. And secondly, you've got to be pretty tough in a political fight. Uh, the, you know, you're up against a lot of competitors. Whether she has the ability to be 
so uh, tough and insensitive and go with the, with the rocks and the rolls? I don't know. We'll see. But she can't sue people as she would like to sue in Britain mm. for, for, for attacking her. I think she'd quite like a political role. I think she'll first wait to see her children into school. She'll build the foundations for it. But, you know, it's a tough life. But she, she's a very good-looking woman. She's sassy. She's got her issues like parental rights and that. So there have been worse people who have been congressmen, mm. so, or congresswomen, so yeah, there's a good chance. It's, um, it would be a complication for Harry, wouldn't it? I mean, whether he's within or outside the royal family, he's still a royal who then would sort of be kind of aligned politically. Well, it's not only for Harry a problem, it's also for Meghan, because when she phoned up the two senators to campaign for women's maternity pay, she said, hello, this is Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex. Yeah, I mean, she yeah. plays the royal card the whole time. So I don't think that would play well in the election for Congress or even the Senate. So I think they've got to realign their image. I mean, I think in any case, they're burning out their royal uh, status pretty fast now. I think that uh, they'll, in the end, have to give that up because it won't wash. Well, that's what I, one of my questions is, is can they make their particular brand of celebrity last? Well, they can only do it by being sensational mm. and by doing something. And I think they're constantly searching for new things to do. But all in the end, the end, it always comes back to returning to London like for the Jubilee so they might be able to be photographed with the Queen. Well, that went wrong. Mm. Or alternatively dumping on the royal family in Harry's forthcoming book. But at some stage, it's going to be a damp squib. It is all about the content, isn't it? And we're expecting a lot of it from the Sussexes later this year. There's the docuseries from Netflix, Harry's memoirs, Meghan's podcast. And what, what do you think we will get from that? It will have to be sensational, won't it? Well, isn't he already? He's dumped on his father for not being a good father. He's dumped on even his grandmother for not having been a good mother to his father. I mean, you know, there's only so far you can go. We were wondering in an episode of Palace Confidential recently if there will be the Netflix cameras in while they thumb through your book in Montecito. Oh, that would be good, can you it? imagine that? Oh, I can imagine it. Uh, <laughs> I'd be very pleased. <laughs> Revelations for Harry, the yeah. truth. Yeah. Perhaps they say, my God, is this true? What will Meghan say? Oh, my goodness. Well, let's, let's see. But of all the things that you did find out writing this mm. book, was there anything that particularly surprised you? Well, I was very intrigued by her relationships with her men friend, her husband and that, and uh, her, her always looking for the main chance and often failing. But all for overall is finding all the people who are angry with her, who befriended her, they thought they were genuine friends, thought they were good relations, and now then felt betrayed. And a lot of women like that, PR women, agents, fellow actresses, who thought that they were, could trust her mm. and discovered the opposite. And that, I think, is pretty interesting. Do you think that um, they're happy, Harry and Meghan? Do you think they have a happy marriage? I think at the moment they do. I know I'm not on the side of the majority in that, but I think when you see them walking together, two needy people, holding each other tightly by the hand. They know they're under attack. They know they've got problems. And they've got an act. They've got a piece of theatre, like in the United Nations or whatever. Yeah. And they are literally looking for an existence. And Harry needs Meghan, I mean, badly. I think at the moment Meghan needs Harry, because what else has she got? And I do think that they sort of have a community but of interest. But Meghan is a schemer. You never know really looking at Meghan, unless you're really deep inside her mind, what she really thinks, what she really wants. And that's the story across America and Britain. People perplexed about a woman who really has betrayed them, dumped them. And that's what many obviously think she'll do to Harry. And the book ends on something of a sad note with the Queen as well, presiding over now, at this time in her life, a very disunited family. Well, I think it's disunited if you look at Meghan, Harry and obviously the troubles of Prince Andrew. On the other hand, I do think she has the pleasure of seeing that William and Charles are reconciled. They had a rough patch and they're determined to push the firm, so to speak, in the right direction. And I think, for example, the announcement that uh, uh, William was going to go and deliver a speech in the environment in Boston is a very clever move. It shows the real royals as opposed to the Montecito royals. Mm. I think they handled the whole Jubilee visit by Meghan and Harry very well. They controlled it and made sure there was no damaging fallout. So I think the Queen can be pleased that her son and grandson are rescuing the problem and repairing the problem and creating a nexus, a tight group who will see the monarchy on through the rest of the century. 
Now, well, speaking of the, the future, I mean, what, what's next for you? There don't seem to be many biographies of Prince Andrew. For I don't think so. No, I think that's, <laughs> that's not no for me. No thought for that? No, no, not for me, no. Couldn't get your teeth into that? No, I, I could, but I don't think I will. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone that you are sort of fascinated with? Well, yeah, but I won't announce it today, don't Oh, mind. <laughs> I'm going to place your bets at Ladbrokes, everybody. But that is all we have time for today. I'm sorry. My thanks very much to Tom Bauer. And a reminder, his new book is called Revenge, Meghan, Harry and the War Between the Windsors. It's published by Bonnier Books and is out now. As always, thanks to you for watching and we'll see you next time on Palace Confidential. Bye-bye.